I'm Joe Giuliani, PhD, and I am your guide for this journey you are about to embark on. Now to survive here in this generation, you're going to have to know a few things. Come along for the ride. I will show you how to live. of how to live. I am your teacher, your professor, your host, and a PhD, Joe Giuliani. I thank you for watching this episode of How to Live. On today's show, we are going to teach you how to be observant. Now by this, we don't necessarily mean watch out for that car in the road so you don't get steamrolled. What we mean by this is to be observant of everything around you, the community, the laws, how things work, and be respectful and think about those sort of things. So for this first lesson of this Be Observant episode, what we are going to ask you to do is to think about us. Think about us. Henry here got on the train with $200. He couldn't see any harm in a friendly game of cards. What if the other men were strangers? And take Joe Collins. He's got a nice wife at home. But he met this girl at the bar, and she looked after the first couple of drinks. There's a good old-fashioned word for people like us. We call them suckers. And there are other people. People who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. There are all kinds of games. Mike here, for instance. He's got everything in me. He's young, he's healthy, got a job. And he's got a kind of food. Big factories to make things a man can use big cities to do the business of a big company, and people, lots of people, enough to work the farm and build the factories, dig the mines, run the business. All kinds of people, people from different countries with different religions, different colored skins, free people. They can live together and work together and build America together because they're free. Free to vote, to say what they please, go to their own churches, to pick their own jobs. Yeah, Mike's got something, all right. He's got America. But there are guys who stay up nights figuring out how to take that away from him. I happen to know the facts. Now, friends, I'm just an average American. But I'm an American-American. And some of the things I see in this country of ours make my blood boil. I see people with foreign apple money. I see holding jobs that belong to me and you. Now, I ask you, if we allow this thing to go on, what's going to become of us real Americans? I've heard this kind of talk before, but I never expected to hear it in America. This fellow seems to know what he's talking about. Well. What are we real Americans going to do about it? You'll find it right here in this little pamphlet. The truth about Jews and foreigners. The truth about the Catholic Church. Do you believe in that kind of talk? I don't know. It makes pretty good sense to me. And I tell you, friends, we'll never be able to call this country our own until it's a country without. Without what? Yeah, without what? Without... Without alien foreigners! Without cats! 
Catholics. Without Freemasons. You know these Freemasons. What's wrong with the Masons? I'm a Mason. Hey, that fellow's talking about me. And that makes a difference, doesn't it? These are your enemies. These are the people who are trying to take over our country. Now you know them. You know what they stand for. And it's up to you and me to fight them. Fight them and destroy them before they destroy us. Thank you. Before he said Masons, you were ready to agree with him. Well, yes, but he was talking about... What about those other people? But in this country, we have no other people. We are American people. What about you? You aren't American, are you? I was born in Hungary, but now I am an American citizen. And I have seen what this kind of talk can do. I saw it in Berlin. What were you doing there? I was a professor at the university. I heard the same words we have heard today. But I was a fool then. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, we human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us. Made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. I saw it first in Berlin in 1932. Five young men that I knew were standing in the crowd listening to the Nazi speaker. Eric was a Catholic. Anton, a student of mine, was a Jew. Heinrich owned a small hardware store. Karl was a farmer. And Hans was an unemployed metal worker. To all Bavarian Germans, I say it is time you inherited the nation which rightfully belongs to you. To you alone belongs the glorious destiny of the greater Germany. The Nazi party will provide land for the farmer, work for the worker, and profits for the small businessman. Who is getting these things now? The Jew. The Jew who has stolen our nation and our birthright. Who makes all the money and takes all our jobs? The Jew. He must be shunned. He must be ostracized. He must be eliminated. And the Catholics, we don't want our great nation run by a foreign church. We Germans will know what to do with these people when the time comes. They and their faith must be destroyed. Then there are the Freemasons. In Germany, we have no place for secret societies. There will be only one society, and that is the Nazi party. There will be no secrecy about that in the new greater Germany. One by one, he attacked each minority and he split them off one from the other. These men were all fellow Germans when they came here today. Now they were split into rival groups, suspicious of each other, hating each other. They were being swindled, all of them. But the man who was really being fooled was Hans. He was pure German, according to Nazi standards. To him, they promised everything and he fell for it. That's how Hans became a superman. They gave him a uniform and they pumped up his ego. He wasn't just a little fellow out of work anymore. He was a member of the master race. Hans and thousands of others like him, all playing a sucker's game. They gambled with other people's liberty. And of course, they lost their own. A nation of suckers. Hitler needed these people. There was lots of work to be done. There were trade unions to be smashed because unions were organized and might offer resistance. There were many political parties in Germany. These the Nazis destroyed. They were determined to smash every organization where people might band together and resist them. There were Jews to be beaten and killed. The Jews were not powerful, but they were a convenient excuse for all the nation's ills. 
And besides, a Nazi party member could not take over this man's store. Hundreds of Catholics were put in jail because the Catholic Church had strength and could resist the Nazi drive for power. They had split the nation into a hundred pieces and then one by one they had destroyed the pieces. Over these broken pieces the Nazis rode into power. One party, one nation, one religion. These men had won their struggle for power. They now ruled all of Germany. But still they had trouble with their oldest and most persistent enemy, the truth. They found that truth does not die easily. And so they decided to abolish truth. One great source of truth is literature. So they burned books, 20 million of them. Many great men in Germany who were spokesmen for truth were jailed or driven from their country. Teachers, writers, scientists. Education was discouraged. In five years, college attendance dropped 53%. It was forbidden to listen to a British radio program or read an American newspaper. In Nazi Germany, you had to get your information from Dr. Goebbels. He knew what was best for you. The church was one force in Germany still strong enough to proclaim the truth in public. This Catholic priest was arrested the following day on charges of immorality. The Protestant church also continued to try and fight for truth. The Nazis put this man in a concentration camp. There were others who spoke for truth, and I am proud to say that educators were among them. And what, may I ask, is an Aryan? I don't know myself. But let us see what our present so-called authorities have to say about it. They say he is tall. Slender. Blue eye. And blonde. There is no Aryan race. And more important, there is no master race. There are people who may find these ideas convenient, but science cannot support them. There is no scientific proof that there's any correlation between a man's racial characteristics and his native ability or character. In all racial groups, we find the same range of potentialities. We find idiots and geniuses. We find criminals and philanthropists. We must judge each man as an individual and not by the color of his skin or his eyes or by the length of his nose. Come in, gentlemen. It's comfortable. And remember that there is no master race. That is a scientific truth. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. And so for all practical purposes, truth had been abolished in Germany. A lot of my German friends wondered what had hit them. How did it happen? Where did it start? It started right here. And this was where it could have been stopped. If those people had stood together, if they had protected each other, they could have resisted the Nazi threat. Together they would have been strong. But once they allowed themselves to be split apart, they were helpless. When that first minority lost out, Everybody lost that. They made the mistake of gambling with other people's freedom. Now let's see how those bets paid off. Carl the farmer was gambling on a better life for himself. What he got was extra hours of back-breaking work, as much as a hundred hours a week. He was forced to stay on his land and produce what he was told to produce, because now Hitler was preparing for war. 
for Heinrich, who owned the hardware store, the bet didn't pay off either. 104,000 small businesses were closed in two years. And for Hans, conditions hadn't improved any. He had a job now in the munitions factory, but he worked long hours for little pay. The working conditions grew increasingly bad. And even though he didn't like the job, he wasn't permitted to leave it. And when Hitler decided the time was right, Germany went to war. Not by declaring war, but by a carefully prepared sneak attack. Once again, Hitler needed Hans to do his dirty work. Hans was an expert at brutality by this time. And Hitler had decided to use Hans and his brutality against other peoples. The Czechs, the Poles, the French, the Russians. But in the crucial test of war, Hitler's race theories didn't pay off. His pure-blooded supermen were defeated by the mongrel armies he despised. By the British of El Alamein. By the Russians at Stalingrad. Then on D-Day by American soldiers of every color and religion who smashed across the Normandy beaches and drove on through to the heart of Germany. For the misguided Germans who had swallowed the Nazi bait, the Nazi game did not pay off. The continent of Europe was strewn with millions of German bodies, pure Aryan bodies. Karl the farmer was left in the snow outside of Moscow. Heinrich stayed in Italy at Salerno. And Hans, who was going to rule the world, got only a little patch of Normandy that he could call his own. We must never let that happen to us or to our country. We must never let ourselves be divided by race or color or religion, because in this country we all belong to minority groups. I was born in Hungary. You are a Mason. These are minorities. And then you belong to other minority groups, too. You are a farmer, you have blues. You go to the Methodist church. Your right to belong to these minorities is a precious thing. You have a right to be what you are and say what you think, because here we have personal freedom. We have liberty. And these are not just fancy words. This is a practical and priceless way of living. But we must work at it. We must guard everyone's liberty, or we can lose our own. If we allow any minority to lose its freedom by persecution or by prejudice, we are threatening our own freedom. And this is not simply an idea. This is good, hard common sense. You see, here in America, it's not a question whether we tolerate minorities. America is minorities. And that means you and me. Let's not be suckers. We must not allow the freedom or dignity of any man to be threatened by any act or word. Let's be selfish about it. Let's forget about we and they. Let's think about us. Now that you know how to think about us and those around you, we're going to teach you another very important lesson in being observant. And this lesson, folks, is very important. There are certain mandates, certain rules, certain regulations that we have to learn and respect. And those are laws. Trust me, folks, I fought the law, the law won. So what we're going to do is in this lesson teach you just how to respect the law. Respect the law. And uh, tell him I'll call him later. I don't want to be disturbed now. Sorry I'm late, Kent. I was delayed in court. Good to see you. Thanks, Mr. Hudson. How's your father? 
had to write. He mustn't. I mean, even though I'm here. Oh? You said you needed the advice of a lawyer. I do. Well, sit down. Tell me what's happened. Well, it's the neighborhood ball club. Mm -hmm. We've got a good diamond, but we've been wanting to build a backstop. Only we don't have any money. I see. Well, they're building this new store in our neighborhood, and, well, there's a lot of lumber lying around, and so... And so one dark night, you took what you needed. There were four of us. They don't know who took it yet, but they're raising an awful fuss. They usually do. But why all the fuss? All we took were a few boards. We need those boards, and they've got plenty more. Kent, take off your shoes. Huh? Let me have your shoes. Guess you know. Oh. You think maybe I left footprints there? I'll just keep them. My boy can use them. You have plenty more shoes. But that's different. How? Are laws made to regulate me and simply to protect you? Sometimes it seems laws are made just to keep us from we want to. On the contrary, Kent. It's law that allows us to live in freedom. Real freedom. Law is one of the cornerstones of our democracy. Kent, imagine what things would be like if we had no law. Suppose we had no constitution, nor any other written law. Then we would have no officers to enforce the law and no courts to interpret the law. Now imagine a quiet evening at home with your mother, father, and sister. Maybe you're talking over plans for the weekend when... occurrences were common on the frontier. Then men banded together as vigilantes to preserve the peace. And finally came the formal establishment of law and order. So you see, Kent, every one of us should have a deep respect for the law because of where we'd be without it. You mean law makes the difference between freedom and... Between freedom and license. Kent, you said you played baseball. Sure, shortstop. Play according to the rules? Why, sure, I... I see what you're driving at. We all didn't follow the same rules. Couldn't have a very good game. You couldn't have a game at all. Yeah, that's right. But where do we get so many laws? Well, you know where you'll find the law, thou shalt not steal. Sure, in the Bible. Oh. That law is over 3,000 years old. Here are some laws. They're not yet one year old. Laws are the result of human experience, Kent. And they're wiser than any man. Take Socrates. When Socrates was condemned to death, his friends urged him to escape. But he refused on the grounds that the law said he must die. And he accepted the law as being right. So we should respect the law, because it represents the accumulated experience of men through the ages. Now, here's another reason. Watch. What about it? It fell down. Naturally. Why does it fall down or toward the Earth? Oh. Sir Isaac Newton, law of gravitation. My point is that an object falls to the earth, not because Newton passed a law, but because the universe is made that way. 
So, stealing is wrong. Not because someone passed a law, but because peace and happiness are impossible unless our individual possessions are secured. We respect laws because law is in harmony with the universe itself. But what about gambling houses that run wide open? They're against the law. They exist when some people fail to respect the law. And where you find gambling wide open, you'll find other things. Open crime, corruption in government, robbery, peaceful citizens' lives in danger. All stemming from a lack of respect for law. Is that what you want? Why, no. So we're all a lot better off respecting the law. You mean, because without respect for law, Law can't operate. Without respect for law, a man can't get a store built. Now, wait a minute. You can't class me with a bunch of gamblers. It's only a matter of the issue, Kent, is not a few dollars worth of lumber. It's your attitude toward law itself. Let me tell you about a case that was in court about a month ago. The defendant was a young fellow, not much older than you. The story is, unfortunately, a rather common one. In his cross-examination, the prosecuting attorney brought out the whole story. It began with a card tray on a hall table at home. That's where his mother kept loose change. He was eight years old. His mother was a busy woman. She wouldn't miss a couple of pennies. No, mother didn't miss the pennies. So he began taking more money. And it became a habit. Until that's what usually happens. You're caught. But not long after, he was driving with his mother. Where the posted speed limit was 35 miles per hour. She was doing 50. And she had punished him for breaking the law. Then, suddenly, what made her slow down? So the little boy learned from his mother that you must obey the law, if there's someone around to enforce it. By the time he'd entered high school, he'd lost all respect for the law. He was a bright boy, but it was easy to cheat. And for him, it was the natural thing to do. And after all, hadn't he heard his father gloat over cheating on his income tax return? So you see how disrespect for law can become a habit? How the parent's example may be followed by the child? Later, he stole a wristwatch and probably showed it to his cronies. Other boys he was infecting with his own disrespect for law. One of these same boys was with him a couple of years later when he made his biggest and most dramatic show of flaunting the law. Yes, it was his biggest show. It was also his last. The law which this young man held in such low regard, the law assured him a fair trial. But still, the law did punish him. He has time now to think about what he's done. And I believe he'll turn out all right. He realizes that his trouble began with two pennies stolen from a car tray. The money wasn't important, not to him nor to his parents. What's important is that from that petty beginning, he developed an attitude of disrespect for law, for all law. And that attitude has come near to ruining his life. So you see, Kent, you should respect the law, if for no other reason, than to keep yourself out of trouble. You mean that, that my taking a few boards could, could lead to something like that? Couldn't it? Yeah, I, I guess it could, but... But, Mr. Laws aren't just a matter of policemen and jails, Kent. We need them only as people disrespect the law. The amazing thing is the small amount of enforcement that is necessary. That's the real proof of the rightness of law. That's why I decided to become a lawyer. 
to help people understand the law, to help promote respect for law. Kent, would you like to help? Me? Yes. Can I? Of course you can. How's this? You get together with these other boys that were in with you on this lumber affair. Mr. Hudson says that if we chip in and make good on the lumber, you sure the contractor won't make any formal charge against us. How about it, fellas? It's okay with me. Well, all right. Hey, wait a minute. Nobody knows who took the lumber. Why pay for it? After all, if we just keep quiet for a while, unless you're going to snitch on us, how about it? Well, I wouldn't want to snitch on any of my friends. It'd be better just to straighten it out. As Mr. Hudson explained it, well, if I saw a man breaking into a store, it would be my duty to report it to the police, wouldn't it? Hey, are you calling me a thief? Because if you are, I'm going to smash you right in the... Sure he is. He's calling himself a thief, too, and he's right. We're all the same. Thanks for the pen, Joey. I sure can use it. Hey, give me that. That's my pen. Why, Joey, are you calling me a thief? <laughs> Hello? Can I speak with Mr. Hudson, please? You get the idea, Joey. A law's a law. You don't saw the line. You just live up to it. Here's the pen. Hello, Mr. Hudson. This is Kent Lawrence. Yeah, the boys are here, and they decided to chip in and pay for the lumber. Yep, all of them. What's that? Just a minute. Mr. Hudson says he's already talked to the man who's building the store. If we show up Saturday at 7.30, he'll let us work out the cost of the lumber, seeing as we want to do it on our own. Well, yes, well. Mr. Hudson, we'll be there. Oh, that's good. And Kent, tell the fellow something for me, will you? Tell them they'll be better off as individuals, and the community will be better off for having them in it. That they will practice respect for law. By knowing the law, by obeying the law, whether there's a policeman around or not, by helping with law enforcement, and by encouraging others to respect the law. Okay, now that you know those laws that are in place and should be followed, what we're going to teach you next in regards to being observant is to know what's going on around you. Know what's in, what's out, what's happening, and what's cool, what's not, and just know the news around you. And for that, we're going to ask you and teach you in this lesson of how to live How to be informed. When our founding fathers established this republic, they created a political and economic system unique among nations. A system which has led the United States to the very pinnacle in wealth and in world leadership. This series of programs is being presented to help all of us understand better our advantages under our American way of life. For today's topic, let's join now a group of young people at the National Education Program Workshop in Searcy, Arkansas. At the classroom lectern is Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr., noted young historian. We're discussing today one of the most precious gifts on earth, American citizenship. American citizenship is a combination of freedom and responsibilities. The privileges of freedom come to us as a heritage from many generations of pioneering Americans. The responsibilities must be developed by each new generation, by each individual citizen. Some of you may be asking yourselves, why should we be bothered with developing citizenship responsibilities? Well, there are many reasons. One of the primary reasons is that great principles do not live from generation to generation without being nurtured, without being kept vigorously alive. Unless we understand and work effectively for the principles upon which our American way of life is founded, the structure will crumble and our heritage of freedom will perish. Another primary reason for the development of citizenship responsibility is that we are living in an era marked by the growth of socialism. To a substantial degree, in one form or another, 
socialism has spread the shadow of human regimentation over most of the nations of the earth. And the shadow is encroaching upon our own liberty. A third major reason for accepting our citizenship responsibilities and working at them is the presence within America of socialists and communist propagandists dedicated to the establishment of a new order. The communist fifth columnist among us are working for world dictatorship. To accomplish this, their strategy is to undermine the confidence of our people in the American system and the principles on which it stands. The socialists among us seek to bring about a gradual change in our system by gradually destroying the principle of the private ownership of property and substituting the socialist principle of government ownership. Now let's be practical for a moment. Is the American way of life worth bothering about? That is, with a viewpoint of self-interest. Well, let's see. We know that under the stars and stripes, we have more freedom than do civilized people on Earth. Our freedom stems from the fact that America is a republic founded on a constitution and dedicated to the principle of democracy and the worth of the individual. The people rule. But some philosophers tell us that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. In other words, food, the material things of life are dear to the heart. Let's look briefly at the material blessings of America. Our nation, although containing only 6% of the land area and 7% of the population of the world, produces 42% of the world's wealth. We know that the average American in all walks of life has a living standard twice as high as the best in Europe where socialism is widespread and from five to 10 times better than in the communist countries such as Russia and China. And if we remember our previous lessons, we know that this economic abundance is possible in America because incentives for progress and the other factors built into our dynamic private enterprise system have enabled us to utilize our resources to the fullest extent. So we do have good sound reasons, both abstractly and in self-interest, for developing citizenship responsibilities toward safeguarding the basic principles of our way of life. But let's put the full challenge in a few words. The world is caught in an era of socialist expansion. Most of the nations are affected. And America is a target. In fact, the number one target of both the socialist and the communist. If we permit our great system to crumble through the apathy of our citizenship, we shall lose not only our freedom, but our prosperity and our still brighter future. What then must we do as citizens? What are our obligations of citizenship? Number one, to understand the American way of life and what makes it tick. For instance, we should understand that our form of government is a republic, not a pure democracy. And we should clearly understand the difference. Who can tell us the difference in a few words? A pure democracy establishes majority rule with a minority overrun. Yes, it does. On the other hand, our republic is based on a constitution which protects minority rights. In our republic, we have representative government, not sheer majority rule. And isn't its authority divided into three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial? Yes, it is. And it's important, too, that in our republic, authority is surrounded by an ingenious system of checks and balances that prevents autocratic or dictatorial rule. That is, if we maintain the Constitution as our basic law. Well, that briefly sums up our political structure. What about our economic structure? Our economic system is based on three major principles. The private ownership of property, the profit motive, and the competitive open market. Yes, those are the three great pillars. Private ownership diffuses the wealth and economic power over the very widest area, over our whole population, and makes our people independent, masters of their own lives. The profit motive, as we have learned, is active in all human behavior. In our economic system, the profit motive is the incentive for new development and constantly expanding production.
And the open competitive market is where the consumer is king. It is this factor in our economy which brings about better goods and lower prices. As one company after another tries to outdo its competitors and get the consumer's business. These are some of the basic facts about our own system which every citizen should know. But now let us go on to additional obligations of American citizenship. Number two, to understand communism, its basic godless philosophy, its goal of world conquest, its insidious tactics, and its cunning strategy. Number three on our list of obligations is to understand socialism and all the cunning disguises in which it presents itself to the American people. Our fourth obligation is to understand propaganda techniques as used by both the communist and the socialist. This is a very vitally important need. Thousands of good loyal Americans have been duped into actually aiding the communist simply because they did not look carefully before they joined some high sounding venture or before they more or less blindly advocated some course of action. Number five in the list of American citizenship obligations is to take an interest in your public schools and in your private and public financed colleges. To take an interest in what's being taught and how it's being taught. And to take an interest in the welfare of the teachers who contribute so much to the development of America. Number six, in addition to voting in all elections, become active in government. Run for local, state, and national office, or help select capable people of the highest integrity to serve. Be constantly vocal on all local and national political issues. Tell your representatives in Congress, or even the president himself, what you think is the best course on issues that come before the public. Number seven, Strive constantly for spiritual growth. We as individuals can push the world along toward mankind's highest destiny if each of us will make the welfare of his fellow man his first concern. And if each of us will apply the principles of God's truth to our political and economic affairs. And lastly, obligation number eight. Dedicate a part of your everyday life to the bringing of these requirements of American citizenship to the attention of fellow students, fellow workers, neighbors, and friends. Is it too much to ask that we fulfill these obligations of citizenship? If we think so, we should read again the history of the founding of this nation and consider the hardships of the people who made possible our freedom. They felt that no challenge was too great if freedom was at stake. That spirit carried them on. It created for us the foundation of our great heritage. We have seen it flare up and burn brightly in every national emergency, on the battlefields and at home. The socialists, the communists, and their followers would like to see the American spirit extinguished. If each of us will rise to the occasion, if every citizen, young and old, will accept the challenge of his citizenship, then the socialist and communist and their followers will not prevail and America will go on toward the fulfillment of her great world destiny. This concludes the American Adventure Series. Our next series of classes in the American Way of Life will be announced soon. For now, class dismissed. The American Adventure Series is a production of the National Education Program, Searcy, Arkansas, Dr. George S. Benson, Director. Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr. was our instructor. This is a continuing series based on the unique political and economic system which has made America great. Watch for the next presentation of the American Adventure. All right, while you were away getting informed, on the board here I wrote, Teach Democracy. That is our next lesson. It is our civic responsibility to pass on democracy to others around us. So for this next lesson on how to live, teach democracy. Teach democracy.
The schoolhouse in America is a familiar sight. To many adults, almost too familiar. In sight, but relatively out of mind. When they do think of it, some people know school as a place where children are taken care of, conveniently for them, five or six hours a day, nine or 10 months a year. Others think of it as a filling station for cramming youthful heads with facts and figures. Still others see school through the rosy glass of childhood memories. Then there are those who know it, know it as a place where the why and how of democracy is learned. But what is democracy? Can a course be written on it? Is it more than a salute? More than a pledge? Greater than patriotism? What is this thing we call democracy? Do the buildings of the national capital give the answer? National structures exist in other nations, but democracy is not architecture. Democracy lives in the lives of our people. People like Senator Jeffrey Ames. Educated as a lawyer, he is now both representative and leader of the people of his state. On this particular Wednesday, he studies, weighs, compares, matches pros and cons on a matter of increased aid to a foreign country. There's a man in his outer office with his own views on that subject. The senator's got to make up his own mind and risk his chance of re-election on his decision. Making decisions is a privilege of democracy. But the same day at the same time, housewife Catherine Colmar also has decisions to make. In her living room in Portsmouth, New Hampshire with her neighbors, she uses the democratic process. A chain broke on a swing in a public playground. Relatively unimportant, not like foreign aid, but a child might have been hurt. New equipment is needed. Money will have to be found for that. Mrs. Colmar finds money every day for home, children, husband's needs. Mother, wife, neighbor, she'll face a bigger problem before this Wednesday is over. And what of John Lawton, California manufacturer? 23 years ago, he was a truck driver for this electrical coil plant. Today, he's president and owner. He has not forgotten his old friends in the plant. He finds time to remember. He worked hard for his success and got responsibility. Now his business is making decisions. He leaves the truck driving and the coil making to others. Even so, he's got his hands full. He can say no to this salesman and stop an assembly line in Detroit. He's going to face a bigger problem today, have a more important decision to make, but he doesn't know it yet. Andrew Maley works in Lawton's plant. Came here about five years ago from a small farm. Worked up to master machinist. He and Lawton aren't as well acquainted as some of the old timers, but they're getting to know each other. Maley's respected by his fellow workers. He always gives a hand when the going gets rough. The way they work, the way they think, produces the goods the nation needs. The adjustment they make on a lathe, the way they settle a grievance, spells democracy. And Andrew Maley is also important to his family. Not just the paycheck he brings home or his love. No, his family affects the way he thinks, the way he makes decisions. And Fred Gorman, the farmer of Pennsylvania, are his decisions important? They are if the nation wants to eat. Mistakes by Fred Gorman and his fellow farmers could undermine the strength of the country. 
Their productivity, the rightness of their procedures, feed and sustain a whole people. What kind of training gave them the knowledge of the land? The seed in the back of Fred Gorman's truck can be cheap or expensive, good or poor. The decision is his. He can improve his herds for the future or make a quick profit now. He was trained to make up his mind about such things. He was trained to take his place as part of a living democracy. And his wife was brought up under the same system She'll have a chance to apply her training before this day is over. There's a problem waiting for Fred Gorman. It came in the mail this morning. Fred's neighbors plan to build a system of reinforced drainage ditches emptying into a pond. That constitutes a problem for Fred and Mrs. Gorman. The best place for the pond is Fred's orchard. It's the lowest land in the area. The neighbors are asking Fred to come in on the project. He'll get better drainage too. But it also means that he'll have to give up his trees. I wonder how Norm Erickson would feel if there were his trees. I bet he'd be glad to settle for the drainage he's got now. Now, Fred, you know this whole area needs better drainage. The Ericsons, look at the trouble they've had the past several years. And you remember Tom Bartlett's silo was almost washed away last spring. We haven't had so much trouble. That's no guarantee, Fred. If we don't do something to help, our land is going to get like theirs. And you know it. I don't like the idea of losing those trees. There's the problem in a nutshell. A tough one to crack. His land and his neighbor's needs. A dictator could solve it for Fred, but he prefers to do his own thinking. Andrew Maley is tackling a hard problem this afternoon. He's come to John Lawton's office to present his fellow workers' views on a pension plan. John Lawton has his own opinions on that subject. One thing they both know, they live in one world, and they were both taught to settle their problems in the world in which they find themselves. Hello, uh, Bailey, uh, sit down. Hiya, Mr. Lawton. What's this trouble you want to see me about? I don't know as I'd call it trouble exactly, Mr. Lawton. I'd like to show you the new pension plan that we've developed. I thought we had discussed the pension plan previously. We've discussed it over and over again, but now here is one item I'd like you to take a look at, right here. Certainly Lawton fights back, but he knows that there are two sides to an argument, and Maley argues to support the responsibility that the men have placed on him. Not yet friends, they may never like each other, but they'll sweat it out together. The problem is mutual, much is involved. The democratic way is involved, and both men were taught to seek objectivity. Catherine Colmar is trying to be objective as she examines a new home. To buy or to continue to rent, that is the question. As she checks with the agent, she gathers all the facts and figures for this evening's discussion with her husband. If they do buy, their present furniture will have to fit into the new space. And do you know the dimensions of the living room? This room is a 15 by 10 room. Well, these figures sound pretty good. My, what lovely ivy on the house next door. Who lives there? I think you'll find those neighbors to be very congenial, Mrs. Colmeyer. An awfully nice family. As a matter of fact, uh, he's the assistant chief at the local county court. A very bright fellow. And his wife is charming, too. They have a son, I believe, of the same age as your eldest. Well, how nice. What's their name? As a matter of fact, they have a daughter, too. Oh? What's their name? Goldstein. Martin Goldstein. Uh, I wonder, do you, uh, 
mind if, if I go out and look at the yard again. I'd like to check the space out there. The agent certainly stalled on that question. She knows religion isn't a question, not in any decent society. How will her husband feel? Is this a pertinent fact to add to all the others in her notebook? What does she herself really think? Is this an opportunity to find out? Facing Mrs. Goldstein and her son across that narrow strip of lawn, does she see before her a bridge or a gulf? Neighbors or strangers? It may be that she sees no problem at all. Maybe she's only wondering where the agent went to school. And Senator Ames, what does the democratic way mean to him? There's that problem waiting for him in his outer office. He has worked hard for understanding. To serve the people of his... He has become something of an expert in foreign economics, forestry, agriculture. Now he faces a constituent who has his own ideas on those subjects. The senator must really hear him and understand him. Well, I heard your speech from the floor of the Senate the other day. Senator, I just can't see it. Why should we American taxpayers have to pay for some broken down, badly run economy halfway around the world just because its house isn't in order and ours is? It's bad business. And I can't see it, and a lot of other voters at home can't see it either. Let's put it this way, Mr. Baker. How would you feel if you had most of the money of our town? If your neighbors were having a rough time of it, with nothing to sell, and no purchasing power? Now, if you sat by and did nothing about them, how would your business be affected? Well, it'd be hard, of course. But that wouldn't be my... It would be hard, and it would be your business. Now, the same thing applies if you put this country in place of yourself in the same situation. It's not only his own opinion the senator advances. There are many in his state who think as he does, others who do not. Which opinion will prevail? Educated himself, he must educate others. He must assume the mantle of leadership, yet know all the time that the opinion of the majority determines a democratic outcome he must help mold that opinion. Problems every day, and the way they are solved determines the way the country functions. Dictate or discuss, the answer is clear. In this country, it is still possible to speak frankly on any given subject. A good merchant knows how to evaluate such public comments. He went to school. It is still possible to have freedom of choice. Problems every day. Yet there is an instinct to be civil and considerate of others. Differences of opinion, surely. Yet differing goals can be reached without lies or bribery or violence. Developed within each citizen is the democratic spirit, the democratic method, the tools with which answers may be found. Those tools are sharpened in the schools of America. Their proper uses are made clear. Learning to read is more than just that. A man must learn to recognize lies, know the danger of the half-truth. A citizen must be able to speak in his own fashion. Neil, would you like to read now? But Peter had a bright lantern which showed him the way, and soon, and soon he had come all the way. That was fine. Karen, would you like to read now? The statesman must know how to make others listen, how to evaluate and transmit what he reads. 
The foundation of national debate on great issues is built stone by stone in the classroom. History is freedom's weapon, fine minds speaking simple truths through the centuries, and sometimes even more important, the lament of tens of thousands dying in a gas chamber. The course of history and the way in which the course was changed, there is a relation between then and now. Perhaps there's a connection between what the men of the Constitutional Convention achieved here and what all of you did last week when you elected George to represent you on the school council. How about it, George? Did the class give you the power to be their boss? Or did they appoint you to speak for them? George isn't our boss. We tell him what to do. We're still the boss, all of us. The housewife taught in this class will know that free citizens must be free from fear. The injustice of the past can kindle the indignation of today. Strange words sound strange until the language is learned. And the ways of the people who speak it must be learned too. Understanding brings respect and liking, a sense of sharing. A team consists of 15 players, whereas soccer requires but 11. Now I imagine a lot of you are still thinking about the big game last weekend. Henry, let's hear you tell us about it in French. Well, er, samedi dernier, we, I mean new, notre école, tous les étudiants notre école went, I mean, étaient, no, uh, new, New jury on feet ball. <laughs> football. Well, how do you say football in French? You're right, Henry. It's almost exactly the same in France as it is here, although they play the game a bit differently. Some say it's a bit rougher. Well, how did the game come out? Faith in the United Nations starts in school. The tolerance of different ways within one world is taught. One world, within one factory, men may speak different languages, or the same words may mean various things to different men. The finding of a common ground begins in school. The tools for living are further tempered in chemistry lab. Of course, learning how a basic oxide unites with an acid helps future chemists. Here, too, are future homemakers and lawyers, Yes, and farmers and realtors, industrialists and craftsmen and senators. They are learning to check and prove, to balance and evaluate. None are born with those skills. They all have to be taught them. Here a boy may learn how to drain an orchard or put his arithmetic to work on a neighborhood problem. Fred Gorman was taught the way to find the answer to his problem in school. He will not forget today. Mrs. Colmar was once an American schoolgirl. She will weigh all the factors on the house. John Lawton and Andrew Maley may not come to a meeting of minds, but they know how to effect a working compromise democratically. The method is the important thing. Senator Ames will do his level best to lead, and his constituent still has an unmarked ballot in his pocket. How will today's children function in a dangerous world? What means will they use to carve the future? Will they be equipped to find the answers to tomorrow's problems? Will they be able to buy a house or run a farm? Are the people who tolerate such schools as these really concerned about democracy's future? Can schools like these be trusted to clarify the minds of democracy's children? There's a reasonable doubt that youngsters can find clarity in schools like this.
A teacher can't hammer out America's future with nothing but his bare hands. teacher has too much work to do, that's obvious, and an underpaid teacher may eventually lose her eagerness, her courage, her self-esteem, or is America too busy to care? Are the needs greater than the most resourceful nation in the world can meet? This classroom is a challenge to democracy. This teacher cannot be asked to meet that challenge alone. A school like this holds more promise for America's future. parents see to it that the school provides a chance for the youngsters to fulfill their potentialities. Regimentation is considered primitive in good American schools. The children have an opportunity to stretch the muscles of their own initiative. They can fly and fancy any place they please. The air age acquires personal meaning. It's not easy to learn the meaning of freedom. The youngsters are learning responsibility, gaining that all too necessary innate sense of right and wrong. In this nation, that's the right according to the law of every child. That right must be extended to more and more children every day. Rights, the right of access to information. The right to think and to speak without fear. The right to work toward chosen goals. But in schools, they learn the ways of liberty which they must practice tomorrow to keep America free. As congressmen, businessmen, housewives, farmers, labor leaders, as Americans, their decisions and the way they make them will determine the nature of our democracy. Today in our schools, we can secure blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now that you're all done teaching democracy, but still hopefully continuing to teach it as your life goes on, we're going to teach you one last important lesson on this episode of How to Live about being observant. And that last lesson is how to be responsible. Be responsible. The policeman on the corner is a good symbol for law. 
Like the policeman, law directs us in doing the right things to live together in harmony. And law forbids us from doing the wrong things that tend to destroy that social harmony. But law is more than the policeman on the corner, more than the courthouse where our laws are enforced, more than the jail where lawbreakers are punished. Law is one of three forms of social control which regulate our daily lives. Custom, what we usually do. Moral code, what we should do. And law, what we must do. Now just how do these social controls affect us? Well, in the teen canteen in our town, we'll find part of the answer to that question. You see, the canteen is always busy early in the evening, but on weeknights, the crowd thins out gradually. So when the clock approaches closing time, things quiet down in a hurry. The club has its own laws about closing and the members obey them. After closing time, you won't find anyone there, except for the three members whose turn it is to clean up. But did I say three? Just us, Betty? Aren't there always three on the cleanup committee? Yes. I wonder who's missing. If it's that Jack McGregor again. It is. I've heard he always ducks out early. It's bad enough with three to clean out, but only two. And he's supposed to be business manager of the canteen. You know, Betty, I'm going to bring this up at the business meeting tomorrow. I'll show that Jack McGregor. I meant to tell you, I'm Betty Honest, Jane. My dad insisted that I be in the house by 11 o'clock. Can't you explain to him? He wouldn't want you to run out on your responsibility. Would he? Take it easy. We're not getting anywhere this way. Staying to clean up is a problem with a lot of us. Even though I'm the chairman of the canteen, I've had to skip cleanup duty to keep from being out too late. Say, maybe weeknights we ought to close the canteen earlier. You'll never get anyone to agree to that. I don't know. Maybe that is the answer. Tell you what, let's meet again when we can have our advisors in to help us work this thing out. As you know, our civic association has been with you from the start. I believe I can speak for the association and as your advisor in recommending that it would be very wise for you to close the canteen on weeknights at 10.30 instead of 11. After all, that's customary in our town. The drug stores, ice cream stores, most of the places of business are closed by that time, and, well, it seems to me that you might close, too. The theater stays open later than 11. But we're not a theater. Some people may question our behavior when we keep the canteen open till 11. I don't think it's right for us to stay out so late. Who's to say what's right? We know what's good for us. Nobody has to stay here till 11, just because the canteen is still open. There's no law that says you have to stay or you have to go. You're a lawyer, Mr. Parks. There's no law, is there? No, Jack, I don't think there is. Now. But I have heard people talking about your late hours here. You'd better realize that the town could pass a law which would compel you to close at 10.30 or 10 or even 9. You see, whatever the community decides is best for itself usually becomes law. The community? Well, aren't we part of the community? Oh, of course you are, Jack. But thinking of the community as a whole... Well, I wouldn't like to see our town pass a curfew law, as some other towns have. Don't you think it would be better for the community and for you if the canteen were to pass its own law to close weeknights at 10.30? And so Jack is learning about social controls. It's customary, said Mrs. Brown. It's right, said Jane. It's the law, said Mr. Parks. Yes, they can all see how these social controls, custom, moral code, and law have always played a part in the activities of the teen canteen. Here, as in our general society, there are a great many customs, and we accept them. Customs of dressing, we're neat and clean. Customs of courtesy, 
we're thoughtful of others. What happens if we violate a custom? It isn't serious. Perhaps we simply lose a little prestige. Nevertheless, customs do control us. We make a habit of following them. And then there are moral codes, sometimes called the mores. These are society's standards about what we should and should not do. They are more deeply ingrained in us. We simply don't cheat in games. We in the society in which we live think that's the proper way. In the canteen, there's no drinking or gambling. That's in line with the moral code of this group. And what happens if we break the moral codes? Well, anyone who breaks these loses social status. He no longer belongs. He's an outcast. And then there's law. Let's return to that business meeting where a new law or rule has been under consideration. It seems we have four good reasons for setting the closing time of the canteen at 10.30 on weeknights. For the convenience of the cleanup committee, we need an earlier closing hour. Then there's the custom in the town and some feel that it's not right for us to stay out late. Finally, we want to be sure that we stay within the laws of the town so that we can continue to govern ourselves without outside interference. With all these reasons, I'm sure the majority of canteen members will vote for 10.30 closing. What do you say? I think it's the only thing to do. I'll agree. Well, we're only advisors. You make your own laws. But I think you'll find that your new law is a good law. Law is a whole body of rules for our conduct made by representatives of the people and enforced by established means. We all know that there are many don'ts in the laws we make. Law prohibits what the majority decide is wrong. Law directs what is agreed to be right. Laws require you to go to school so that you and society will benefit. And laws provide the schools for you to attend. Thus every day you come in contact with social controls, with custom, with moral code, and with law. Suppose this were you, what social controls affect you? Well, in your family, and your school, and your church, in your whole community there are customs and moral codes which guide your actions. Many of these customs and mores are enacted into formal laws. The town or city in which you live has laws which control you. There are state laws passed and enforced by state governments. And the federal government in your name makes laws which affect you. And we are hopefully working toward a still higher level of law, the law of nations united for world peace. You are guided by all these laws and controls. The new law for closing at 10.30 was agreed upon by a majority of the members of the teen canteen. The good law because it agrees with the customs, the moral codes, and the laws of this group and of this community. In a democracy, such laws and social controls belong to the people who live under them. These laws are yours to make wisely, to change intelligently, to understand and live by. Now that you know how to be responsible, you should have all the lessons you'll ever need on how to be observant. I thank you for watching this latest edition of How to Live. I'm your professor, your teacher, your host, and your guy to go to, Joe Giuliani, Ph.D. Thank you for watching this latest edition of How to Live. We'll see you next time.